As uh, most of you students of the Constitution or fans of the Constitution know, it was on September 17th in 1787 uh, that the Constitutional Convention wrapped up its work and 38 members one by one walked up to sign what was uh, the first iteration of this Constitution, which has been amended, as you know, over the years. Um, ge in geographical order, each of the delegates uh, with, starting with New Hampshire, all went up and, and uh, willingly signed, and only three who were there didn't uh, lend their signatures to this, to this document. Um, they met in secret, you know, and uh, when the work was done, the, wor the doors flew open and the word went out to the folks in the street, and someone asked Ben Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? And Franklin responded, a republic if you can keep it. Well, we have more or less kept a republic uh, for 226 years, and now 227 years we commemorate today. And we're going to celebrate that today with a program that we hope you will enjoy. We're supported in this and very grateful uh, for the support of the Alfred B. Katz Constitution Day Fund. It's an endowment established by our, by our graduate, Lewis Katz, who is here today, to honor his father, who uh, also was a lawyer, a 1935 graduate of this college, who was born on Constitution Day in uh, 1911, 100 and 103 years ago today. We're honored to be honoring your father, Lewis, and thank you so much for the support. Um, with me today, I am, by the way, the Dean of the College of Law, Lou Bilionis, and I am um, uh, pleased to introduce my two wonderful constitutional law colleagues, Ronna Greff Schneider and Christopher Bryant, who are going to um, uh, illuminate for you uh, developments in the American Constitution over the last uh, year or two. Uh, they're generous enough to allow me to also uh, chime in with a few words or thoughts as well. Um, our objective, and it's in keeping with Constitution Day, is to, uh, to look at the Constitution with a mind uh, that it speaks not only to lawyers, but in particular speaks to the public. And uh, it's a legal document, but it's also a source of values um, that frame American constitutions and controversies. And so we want to explore those controversies of which you are familiar, with which you're familiar, the ones that are claiming public attention and headlines today, and hope, hope to leave you with um, a better understanding of them, some themes that seem to be emerging to us that help us at least make sense of what is occurring today. You'll hear from uh, Professor Bryant first, then Professor Schneider, and then, then I'll, I'll have a few words. We're going to do our level best to leave some time for uh, questions and comments from you. And uh, lest I forget, let me encourage you to come upstairs at the end of the hour to the atrium where there'll be uh, refreshments and, and um, uh, the opportunity to continue the conversation. So thanks very much for being here. Professor Bryant? Lou, with your permission, I might, might speak from here if that's OK. Um, just because I need the, are, are you, does that give you anxiety? Um, the, um, because um, I need the uh, lectern to be able to read my notes and because microphones do not agree with me. Um, that's, that's on the assumption that can folks in the back hear me? Okay. Um, that? Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot um, uh, to the Dean uh, for this invitation and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, I want to very, very briefly uh, discuss three and a half cases. Um, in the 15 minutes that I've been given. Um, why the fourth case is only a half case will become apparent when we get to it, I think. Um, in any event, because I've got a wide uh, uh, bit of ground to cover, I'm going to have to fly. So forgive me for um, uh, passing over uh, some interesting uh, things and some uh, details um, that uh, deserve mention, but just do not have, uh, we do not have time to, to do so. Um, I believe that these, ca <coughs> these cases are joined by a common theme, uh, namely that the Roberts Court, as it approaches its 10th birthday, is a court that is profoundly interested in constitutional uh, questions of constitutional structure, particularly at the federal level, uh, and is deeply committed to a vigorous judicial role in enforcing a particular vision of that structure. Uh, nor has it proven reticent, especially recently, uh, about doing so, even when doing so embroils it in some of the most significant and contentious disputes 
vexing our elected branches of the federal government. The um, three cases, actual, actual cases, that I want to discuss uh, in order of decision and uh, in my presentation are Shelby County v. Holder, McCutcheon v. Federal Election Commission, and National Labor Relations Board v. Noel Canning. <coughs> the half case comes at the end. Shelby County v. Holder. Uh, this case concerned the constitutionality of a key provision of what was truly landmark legislation, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, it was an ingenious and uh, ra uh, rather counterintuitive strategy to address an intractable problem. Uh, nearly a century after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, African American voting registration, in, uh, especially in uh, wide swaths of the South, were uh, remains uh, mired in single digits. Um, now, what was interesting is the act adopted, and this is why I call it somewhat counterintuitive, uh, a strategy of preclearance. Um, the act froze in place the existing status quo. You might think that if you're in a situation where um, things could just about not get worse, the last thing you'd want to do is make changes difficult. Um, but there was a theory behind this, and it was an ingenious one, and that was that past litigation efforts had proven ineffective because litigation always moves more slowly than um, folks on the ground who are committed to making it difficult for certain persons to vote. So that if one thing, um, particular practice, was struck down as violative of the 15th Amendment or prior civil rights legislation, um, then um, while the case was rolling forward, another um, uh, obstacle would be thrown up to uh, effective enfranchisement. And until the litigation process could get going again and uh, be brought to bear on that one, it in turn would be effective at, prevent, at preventing African American enfranchisement or other minority enfranchisement. Uh, section 5, the preclearance requirement, when coupled with other sections, was hugely successful. And that's not just my view, uh, that is a uniform assessment. In fact, the uh, m uh, debate to some extent on the court in Shelby County v. Holder it was whether the act was going to be made a victim of its own success. Um, uh, but Section 5 preclearances requirement did not apply, and for uh, reasons both political and perhaps practical, could not apply uh, everywhere. Um, rather, only applied in to certain uh, parts of the country. I'm going to reach around your hair a little bit. Oh, sure. right. um, so the 1965 Act created a coverage formula, uh, and it was as followed, follows, that the preclearance requirement would apply in those jurisdictions where there had been uh, found to be a discriminatory test or device used in the 1964 election and where less than 50% registration or turnout in the 1964 presidential election had occurred. Um, that test covered uh, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Virginia, parts of North Carolina, and Arizona. The act had a five-year sunset provision, um, but in 1970 it was reauthorized. The coverage formula was, was expanded to include data from the 1968 presidential election. 1975 was reauthorized again, and the coverage formula was again adjusted to include data from the 1972 election. In 1982, the act was reauthorized for a 25-year period, this time with no change to the coverage formula. And then again in 2006, it was reauthorized for another 25 years, again with no change to the coverage formula. It was this 2006 reauthorization that was challenged by Shelby County, Alabama. The court's June 25, 2013 decision, um, in, uh, in a five to four ruling, the court invalidated the Voting Rights Act, the Voting Right Act's 2006 coverage formula, effectively nullifying the preclearance requirement. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Roberts insisted that the 1965 Act had, and I'm quoting, employed extraordinary measures to address an extraordinary problem which, though permissible at the time, were at the very outer limits of Congress's power to enforce the 15th Amendment. By carrying forward standards employed in prior, prior reauthorizations, that is, coverage formula from prior reauthorizations, the 2006 Act um, captured states and parts thereof according to literacy tests and lower voter turnout from the 1960s and 1970s. Quoting again from his opinion, but history did not end in 1965. 
By the time the act was reauthorized in 2006, there had been 40 more years of it. And yet the coverage formula that Congress reauthorized in 2006 ignores these developments, keeping the focus on decades-old data relevant to decades-old problems rather than current data reflecting current needs. Um, Justice Ginsburg, dissenting for uh, four justices, stressed both the deference the court owed to Congress's enforcement uh, exercise of its enforcement authority under the Reconstruction Amendments, as well as the considerable evidence Congre ha Congress had amassed uh, supporting its conclusion that absent a preclearance requirement, barriers to minor minority voting would reassert themselves in covered jurisdictions. And a particularly um, uh, poignant uh, statement, I thought, about the danger of backsliding, she wrote, uh, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and, and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Um, I think that uh, Justice Ginsburg is starting to write like Justice Scalia. Um, well, here's why, here's the significance, uh, why, why I point to this uh, case as uh, significant to my thesis. The elected branches, and to a very great extent, even prior Supreme Court decisions, here I'm thinking, for example, City of Bernie v. Flores, had treated the Voting Rights Act as something of a uh, political and judicial sacred cow. But just over a year ago, the court sent that cow to market. Um, reasoning that the act had conflicted with what it perceived as fundamental federalism values concerning both the equal sovereignty of the states and the limits of the enumerated powers of Congress. Um, case number two, McCutcheon v. FEC. Um, since Buckley v. Vallejo was decided in 1976, there's been a fundamental distinction in cons the constitutional law of campaign finance between contributions on the one hand and expenditures on the other. As I explained to uh, my class, perhaps in um, uh, overly simplistic terms, the difference is to, is to whom the check is made out to. Um, a check that goes to a candidate's campaign fund is a contribution. Um, a check that goes to ABC or the New York Times um, to buy um, an ad, perhaps that you wrote, is an expenditure. Uh, from Buckley v. Vallejo, from 1976, the court has treated those two kinds of uh, forms of money and politics very differently. Expenditures being treated as uh, the equivalent of pure speech and protected by the strictest of judicial scrutiny. Um, contributions being treated as more of a form of association, um, less directly uh, implicating First Amendment values, and also threatening the risk of uh, corruption at, to a greater extent than expenditures, therefore subjecting them to kind of an intermediate, more deferential scrutiny. And in Buckley v. Vallejo, the expenditure limits were invalidated, but the contribution limits were upheld. That kind of uneasy compromise has reigned in the area of campaign finance regulation ever since, or that is, it did until April 2nd of this year. Um, that line had been assailed, um, but it had held until then. But on that day, April 2nd of 2014, the court once again uh, divided five to four, once again in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, struck down the aggregate limits um, federal election law had placed on the total amount of money an individual can make in contributions to political campaigns. Um, it left in place the so-called base <coughs> limits. So there still is a limit on the amount that a contributor can give to a particular candidate, somewhere around um, $5,200 per election cycle. Prior to McCutcheon, um, the aggregate limit under federal law, that is the total amount you could give to, to all candidates, and by the way, it's not just candidates, there are also political action committees, um, uh, uh, the committees for uh, political parties, was somewhere around $123,000 per election cycle. I consider myself a generous person, but I had never bumped up against that limit personally. Um, but, but some people had, and Sean McCutcheon uh, was one of them. Um, now estimates vary because of exactly um, uh, which kind of entities can be contributed to, but most agree that the, with the elimination of the aggregate cap, with the sum of the base uh, uh, contribution caps allows an individual to contribute to um, a party or its causes something like $3.6 million. Um, just take a message, um, I'll, I'll get back. Um, now, the reason I think this case is significant um, uh, is because it's uh, the first ruling uh, since Buckley that really has, where a majority has been willing to tinker with the contribution limits. 
They've reported to carry forward an intermediate uh, scrutiny, more deferential than um, the uh, scrutiny applicable to expenditure limits. Citizens United, the cause of much acclaim, was an expenditure limits case. Okay, but this is the first contribution limits. They reported to carry forward an intermediate scrutiny, but it's hard to deny that in practice there's a ratcheting up of the rigor with which that scrutiny is applied. Um, I think another question is, is this um, sort of a step along the road? There's some question, are we waiting for the other shoe to drop and for a future case to invalidate base limits as well? But again, my point is that the Roberts Court is not um, shying away from matters with obvious significant potential political impact. Finally, um, in terms of the final actual case I have to talk about, actual decision to talk about, National Labor Relations Board v. Canning. Um, it was a uh, uh, case about the recess appointments clause. Please do not fall asleep. Um, it, um, uh, there actually are interesting things to be said about the recess appointments clause, and I think interesting not to folks um, even other than me. Um, it, it says in pertinent part, the president shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. Now, the court divided five to four uh, in a uh, majority by uh, Justice Breyer um, on the kinds of questions that I admit only someone like me could truly love. Um, questions like whether the recess referred to uh, only inter-session recesses, recesses between sessions of Congress, or breaks that Congress took during its session. The uh, five justice majority ruled that it applied to both intra as well as intercession recesses. Also, there was a debate about what um, may happen during means, uh, whether vacancies that came into being before a recess should count. Again, the majority said yes. A four-justice dissent said no. I found all of this very interesting. Um, you, you might think that the fact that the majority deferred to the administration, in other words, they adopted broader understandings of the recess appointment authority on both of these questions, would make this case kind of an odd data point for my thesis. And I did have a little, ang a little anxiety about that. I'll, I'll confess as I read it. But I actually think it still is, is a very instructive case for my point, because none of this should obscure the fact that in a 9-0 ruling, the um, court invalidated the administration's appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, ruling that the Senate's use of pro forma sessions precluded presidential invocation of the clause. So again, if, if, if I can underscore, to me, the significance is that though they disagreed about these interpretive questions, the bottom line is all nine justices saw that the court ha deserved a seat at the table um, and did have a role in playing um, uh, umpire as to whether um, this dispute among the branches was properly resolved by the administration's uh, uh, not ridiculous view that a pro forma session did not count as a session and did not interrupt a recess. My half case is Boehner v. Obama. Um, uh, a half case because it's not really a judicial event yet. Um, as you no doubt know from reading the papers, in July the U.S. House of Representatives authorized Speaker Boehner to sue the President and therein assert that President Obama's delay in implementation of portions of the Affordable Care Act uh, amounted to a violation of the President's constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. To be sure, there's a little irony in the Speaker suing the President for not sufficiently vigorously enforcing a law the Speaker hates. Um, but I understand the point, um, both political and constitutional, of the suit. Uh, and the reason I mention it here, and without in any way speculating as to what might be cause or what might be effect, I do think the fact of this decision and the House's authorization of it reflects a recognition, if not an acceptance or even a reliance on the use of federal courts to mediate what is or are obviously highly partisan and traditionally political disputes. <coughs> Uh, so in that sense, I think it is of a, of a piece of the three rulings I have talked about. Um, I want to be clear that uh, my, my thesis is an <coughs> observation that I really primarily mean to be descriptive. Uh, I'm not trying to make a normative a point about the courts, whether the court's assertion of this role is all for the good or all for the bad. And if you wanted to know into my heart of hearts, I have mixed feelings about these cases. Really don't like one, don't know what to think about the other, kind of like uh, a third one. Um, but uh, what is striking to me is that you do have a um, uh, sort of judicial chutzpah uh, in moving in these areas. At least that's my thesis. At least that's my story. I'm sticking to it uh, until I hear from your comments or questions, which I look forward to. I also look forward to my colleagues' comments. Thank you.
can you hear me in the back row? I'm going to stick with your story here that uh, I too like to speak uh, not into a microphone and I kind of like this lectern so I'm a little bit more home at home here. So I'd like to pick up on a couple of points that Chris made to show you that it, it uh, has some broader meaning even than his three and a half cases that he talked about. And that is, as we talk about Constitution Day, and we obviously talk about the Constitution, as the three of us were discussing it, we said we don't want to just look at the court. We want to look at a broader kind of idea. And when Chris was talking about the uh, Voting Rights Act, two things came to mind that are relevant to what I'm about to talk about. One is the importance that the court and the Constitution both play in terms of access to the political um, arena. And the second one is uh, in terms of how, um, how the Roberts Court is picking up on some of the issues that are the most controversial issues in our society at large. So I'd like to talk about three cases. Um, I don't have a half one, sorry. <laughs> uh, I only have three cases, and I gave you in the handout a lot of detail about the case, the cases, because they're quite complex, not only in the issues that they're dealing with, but the lineup of the justices. Um, they are very illustrative of what we are commonly seeing in this court, which is a very strong fragmentation not only a division between the exact holding, but a fragmentation among the justices as to how they get to that result. And um, that's one of those things that I find really fascinating. I don't know how popular it'll make you among your friends who aren't lawyers, but I think it's very interesting, and I'd like to kind of leave <coughs> some of that detail to my handout, but I do want to keep emphasizing it. So the theme of these three cases, because uh, for me today, um, may be hard for you to figure out because the three cases on the surface look like they have nothing to do with each other. I don't have quite as strong a bond as Chris's cases. So one case deals with what I refer to as prayer in the public sphere. One case deals also with religion, but how it bumps up against some other very important, <coughs> already recognized constitutionally and, in this case, statutorily protected rights. And the third one deals with what to do about affirmative action. Uh, the court has, of course, taken that uh, issue up several times, and this is the fallout from what's left of affirmative action in terms of its application today, at least in the higher education. So, the theme, though, of my talk, since those three cases probably don't seem very related to you, is what role does the Constitution play, and likewise the court in construing the Constitution play in our national identity? What can we say that the Constitution does for us in terms of defining our national identity? More specifically, what does it say in terms of how we as a nation go about problem solving, particularly in our society as we are growing more and more plural, as more and more diverse, we are in a greater pluralistic society. So what do we do about problem solving and how does that reflect on our national identity? More specifically, I guess I'd have to ask the question, does all of this reflect the fact that we may be undergoing what is commonly referred to as a clash of cultures? Not only legal cultures, but social cultures. And how does that all play out with regard to the Constitution? Um, and bottom line on that is, can the answers to any of those questions be static? After all, the document itself doesn't get rewritten every time we have a new issue or any of these issues. So what role does that say that the court should be playing in construing the Constitution as it guides us into this national identity and problem solving mode? So let's do kind of some summaries, if you will, of the various justices here. 
I can see what my research assistant sitting over there smiling, going, yeah, yeah, we talked enough about all these details. Let's just kind of look at the big picture. Okay, so let's take a look at that. All right, so as I mentioned, two of the cases deal with religion. Okay. Different aspects of it, one pure establishment clause issue, one uh, dealing with the other religion clause, which is, of course, the free exercise clause, and how that deals with the issues of gender equality, specifically with regard to health matters and reproductive freedom. And the third case, as I mentioned, deals with race. Mm -hmm. All of the cases, as you can see from my handout, have multiple opinions. All of them have passionate dissents. Two of the opinions are written by Justice Kennedy, who everyone likes to call the swing vote. In one, he's lucky enough to be saying that he's writing the majority opinion, that is the town of Greece. In the other one, even he couldn't muster a um, majority, so he's only writing a plurality, and that's uh, in the Schwede case. Mm -hmm. With regard to the dissenters, they are written by the three women on the court, one Justice Sotomayor, one Justice Ginsburg, and one Justice Kagan. They managed to get at least one other justice on their dissent, but in many cases, if you put together the, the <coughs> opinions, piece them together, they're in essence mostly getting four justice dissents. So, let's take a look at what the issues are in these cases. As I said, they're certainly going to raise the issue of religion. Mm -hmm. And we can ask the question whether or not religion is special in our society. That's been a question that gets asked a lot. And the answer, I think, is probably it is, whichever way you come down on these issues, for a couple of reasons. First, because it is specifically mentioned in the Constitution, not only the Constitution generally, but the First Amendment. And it has two clauses all to itself. The Establishment Clause, which is the Separation Clause, and the Free Exercise Clause, which is the Religious Liberty Clause. Second, it's been around for a long time in our society. Um, as recently as 1952, we have a justice actually saying we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose belief in a supreme being. You might be surprised to know that that was Justice Douglas, who most people think of is probably not coming down on that side. Mm -hmm. But he did very strongly. Um, and we take that through situations where as early as 1869, Cincinnati was in the limelight of the country in this issue, in a, what's known today as the Cincinnati Bible War in which it was one of the first school districts, not the very first, but one of the first districts to take the Bible out of public schools. Now, it wasn't doing it on constitutional grounds, but it was doing it on the basis of something that I really think is at the heart, at least in part, of, no, no pun intended there, uh, rhyming pun, uh, at least in part of the Establishment Clause, and that is there was a struggle between two different religions over control of a public institution, that is, a struggle between the Catholic population in Cincinnati and the Protestant population in Cincinnati over control of the Cincinnati public schools and which Bible to have in the schools. And in, a, in an effort to eliminate that problem, the Cincinnati public schools said, okay, we're taking the Bible out of the schools. And they were sued by a group of parents who wanted the Bible back in, in fact, they wanted their Bible back in to re kind of take control over the curriculum of the schools. And that case went to litigation and went all the way up in Ohio state courts. And by the time it reached the Ohio Supreme Court, they backed the school system itself, okay, and took the Bible out of the schools. Well, the concept of religion in the public schools has stayed with us very strongly since 1962. And you may be interested to know that the author of one of those opinions was Justice Kennedy, who wrote in a very strong opinion that 
you could not have prayer at a middle, public middle school graduation. That same Justice Kennedy will write the opinion in Town of Greece versus Galloway. That's the, one of the first cases I'm going to talk about. And in that case, he said that the town of Greece, not the country, the town of Greece can have its monthly town board meetings begin by having a volunteer prayer giver give a prayer. And he took a lot of efforts, probably not surprising, to distinguish why it was okay in this context from some other cases. And what he said was, the town of Greece had decided to ask for volunteers, whoever wanted to come forward to give a prayer, to do so. They made no effort to uh, look at the prayer beforehand. They made no effort to give any rules about it. They made no effort to edit it. They said nothing about it afterwards. All factors that he found critical because what he said was this is just an expression of who we are. So immediately he's jumping into the national identity question. It's a reflection that we are religious and that we use, not in the sense of you know, what, you, what you actually practice, but in the sense that we use religion to solemnize things, to say this is important, and that's what we were doing here. And just as the court had previously said it's okay to start a legislative sec section that way, they did it this way. Now he has a very strong dissent in that case that says that's not what this is about because all of the prayers were not generic. That is, they were sectarian, and most of them were Christian. And this dissent by Justice Kagan was that this is against the norm of religious equality in this country, the very purpose of the Establishment Clause. In the second case dealing with religion, the Hobby Lobby case of national fame here in terms of people talking about it, said that under a statute, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a non, excuse me, a corporate, for-profit corporation was a person for purposes of asserting under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act the right of religious liberty, the right to exercise religious liberty. And the imposition under the Affordable Care Act on that corporation to provide certain services to women namely certain services that they believed, the owners believed, caused abortion, was against their religious beliefs and therefore was an undue burden on a sincerely held religious belief. And the government did not use the least restrictive way of implementing that requirement, even though the court recognized, as the, act, as the law says, that it is a compelling governmental interest to provide these services for women under the act. Okay. There, in the same decision, uh, as, as I said, was written by um, Justice uh, Alito in this case, there is a strong dissent which argues you can't just look at the religious liberty aspect of it. Instead, you have to look at what it's balanced again. And so what you see in this case, as I think you see in all the cases that I'm talking about, is this clash of culture and identity and religious, excuse me, constitutional rights. That is, on the one hand, you have the free exercise right. On the other hand, you have the compelling governmental interest in providing the services for women under that act, okay? Uh, Justice Ginsburg writes an extremely strong dissent looking at the, cons the, the legislative history of the act as well as the interest of women and in having those services for their health. The final case that I want to talk about is the Schwedy case. And that's a fallout of the Bruder case that upheld affirmative action at the University of Michigan Law School. The day after that decision was handed down, this case began. That is, the voters in Michigan would want to have a right to decide whether or not to use affirmative action. In this case, Justice Kennedy was not able to muster a uh, majority, but in a plurality decision, he said it's the ballot box that can reign over anything 
that's not mandated by the Constitution. That is, he said, affirmative action is permitted but not required by the Constitution. And so what you see here in this case, I think, is a conflict between the concept of democracy as represented by the collective voice in the government and the Constitution, which certainly by its provisions, particularly the Bill of Rights, is designed to protect minorities, however you define that, from the tyranny of democracy in the sense of majority making a decision that, uh, uh, that uh, impacts upon them. So in that case, the court said, and as I said in the plurality opinion, that the ballot box wins. In a dissent by Justice Sotomayor, she said this case is about race, and it's not about just the merits of affirmative action, because we've decided that already in the Grutter case. But it is about democracy in the sense that equal protection protects the right of equal access to the ballot box. And in this case, by making only affirmative action subject to a constitutional amendment, which is what the voters did. They put it in the Constitution that you cannot use affirmative action. They are making it a different kind of participation only on minorities. And that violates the whole concept of the Constitution as it interprets the idea of political democracy. So if we look at all of these cases together, I think what you're seeing is a similar thing to what Chris talked about, and that is that the Roberts Court is certainly not shy about stepping into controversial issues. And I think what it's doing in, in, in these cases is reflecting on its role in forming the national identity. Well, I'll, I'll follow suit and speak from here. Can you hear me? Good. I, I am um, going to talk about cell phones and same-sex marriage. Um, and uh, they have more in common, uh, I hope you'll see, than, than you might think. There are two developments uh, in constitutional law and controversy over the last several years that I want to call to your attention um, and speak to. One concerns the Fourth Amendment and privacy and these things. Um, and the other concerns liberty, personal autonomy, equality, and marriage equality and same-sex marriage. Um, there's a lot more that they share in common, and that's what I want to explore today. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, let me frame it quickly. Um, in, in a case called Riley versus California, which is noted on page eight, um, a unanimous Supreme Court, not a hotly divided court, no dissents here, um, reached, the, reached a, a, a very uh, a apparently easy decision that when a police officer arrests someone lawfully to, and takes her or him into custody and performs the typical search incident to an arrest without a, without a warrant and takes your wallet and looks at it and takes your diary and looks at it and takes your calendar and looks at it and opens your pocketbook and rummages through, they can't open this up and look inside at the digital information. Um, a unanimous decision. The Supreme Court of the United States has not yet decided the question of same-sex marriage uh, in its purest sense, although it has handed down decisions that point significantly to it, particularly the Windsor decision from last year that uh, struck down the, the Defense of Marriage Act. What we are seeing across the land is something, um, to say it's unprecedented, one must off, off, be, be cautious, but I, in my lifetime, have not seen a movement in the lower courts like what we are seeing today with respect to same-sex marriage. There are some 20 federal courts since the Windsor decision of last year that have spoken on the question of same-sex marriage, and they, but for one, and that one was only decided about two weeks ago, have come down all the same way without regard to which president put, the, put that uh, judge on the court. There has been a real groundswell. And where, whereas uh, not many years ago, no human being in this country could, could engage in a same-sex marriage, today there are 19 states, plus the District of Columbia and several Native American tribes, which recognize uh, the right to do so. 28 states still have constitutional bans. Now, what do these developments have in common? Well, first of all, to my mind, they're both case studies 
and actually pretty similar case studies at some levels on how constitutional law and understanding evolves over time. And today on Constitution Day, it's not a bad observation to make that indeed the Constitution that we experience and discuss today, while textually very similar to the one that was passed in 1787, uh, operates quite differently today. It does evolve in many, many ways. These cases, these scenarios, these developments also um, involve the expansion of constitutional protections uh, with notably strong consensus, which um, is worth noting in a world today where we typically speak of controversy when we think of change. We think of divisiveness when we think of change. We speak of polarization when we think about national problems. Yet here, um, while there is not an absence of dissent fully, certainly so in same-sex marriage, you are seeing the evolution of, of of, of constitutional discourse. You're seeing the Constitution at work as a device that allows us to react to change and find ways to come together um, and to achieve, perhaps not unanimity, but to achieve consensus around fundamental values as social conditions change. Now, I want to get to those changes in just a minute, but let me just frame the problem a little more clearly for you. If you went back a few years ago, it would have been child's play to make an argument that the police officer had every right to go through this. I won't spend time going through the precedents, but my little illustration about the pocketbook and the diary ought to be good enough for you. Um, with respect to same-sex marriage, there was a per curiam Supreme Court decision of a memorandum variety back in 1972, which under the rules of the game should be controlling. Um, that there is no substantial federal question when it comes to a claim um, that someone should have a right to same-sex marriage. Now, there are doctrines that say that when enough things have changed since then, um, a lower court is at liberty to ignore that precedent. But as, as, as recently as 1972, they didn't even think it merited a discussion. And then, of course, in 1986, the Supreme Court of the United States, um, in a divided court, upheld the right of a state uh, to uh, send uh, gay men to jail for, uh, for sodomy. Um, it wasn't until 1996 when this began to change with the Romer versus Evans decision in the Supreme Court. But what's changed more broadly? Um, in the Fourth Amendment, profound technological change. Um, we did not imagine that the materials that used to be hidden away in your file drawers at home, in your, in your, uh, in your most cherished uh, private spaces, are now immediately accessible on these devices. Um, and uh, and uh, what, is re what became a realization was that doctrine that easily pointed in one direction was now threatening the very fundamental values that the doctrine is supposed to be serving rather than threatening. Um, with same-sex marriage, what we've obviously seen is that uh, is, is that uh, our society uh, now sees gays and lesbians when before it didn't. Uh, the closet has been opened, it, it has been opened, excuse me, and uh, there's a growing recognition over time that uh, what an earlier generation may have thought to be perfectly natural uh, distinction uh, becomes harmful discrimination and increasingly uh, a discrimination that is harder and harder to justify in words that make sense to an America in the 21st century. Lewis Powell, who joined the majority upholding the constitutionality of sodomy laws, was uh, quoted thereafter as saying that at the time he didn't think he knew a gay man. One of his clerks at the time was, turned out to be a lawyer later who had the pleasure of arguing Lawrence versus Texas to the Supreme Court, which struck down, ultimately, that same sodomy law and uh, overruled Bowers versus Hardwick. Now, there are differences galore between these two scenarios, but I hope you can see that the, the, the simple proposition is that over time, we see our nation, as it speaks about constitutional values, identifying interests that have been submerged beneath doctrine, freeing them up and asking, do we need new law 
a new frame of reference in order to, to a fairly, fairly speak to these fundamental values in a changed nation. Now, these, case, these changes in the courts have not come rapidly. Um, that's the second point I want to make about a case study in constitutional change. Sometimes things change rapidly, and frankly, when they change that rapidly in jurisprudence, you tend to see lingering discord, lingering divisiveness. But changes that are processed a little more uh, uh, slowly, if you will, with more voices at play, tend to uh, anchor themselves better when they're finally uh, really inked uh, into the US Supreme Court annals. Um, in the Fourth Amendment area, the court took up a number of new technology cases over the last decade. And I won't bother to elaborate them in, in detail now. But what was interesting was that they were, you could see that they were feeling their way uh, to, to, uh, to a better understanding of what privacy interests were really going to be at stake in, uh, in, in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence and a new technology. But they would protect those interests with a crazy amalgamation of theories. Justice Scalia, favoring originalism, would vote in favor of the individual privacy interest, but using old doctrines about trespass um, and uh, property interests. The new guard on the court, the court that was not, that is viewing itself as not bound by that textualism and originalism, was trying to explore the nature of what's a robust but realistic protection of privacy in the 21st century. Um, ultimately, uh, they, uh, they got to this case, Riley, and um, in, in my view, broke from any apparent necessity to cling to old doctrines of trespass and property that shaped Fourth Amendment law, but instead simply cut to the chase and recognized that these contain a tremendous amount of privacy that needs protection regardless of what pre-existing precedents might have said. And so we've entered a new era now, I believe, <coughs> uh, with a new way of looking at this. With same-sex marriage, similarly, there's been a gradual, uh, although certainly now accelerated, uh, process of inquiry. What I want to call to your attention is that it, it's, been, it's been about, uh, about 18 years now since the Supreme Court really delved into this with the Romer versus Evans decision that struck down a, uh, a referendum provision in Colorado that forbade uh, the protection of, of uh, a specified protection against uh, discrimination <coughs> visited upon gays and lesbians. Um, so it's been 18 years. What has been fascinating to watch as this has moved forward is that the court has worked very close to the ground the way that this issue would have been discussed 20 years ago was, is there a fundamental right? Should we be doing strict scrutiny? Or is there mere rationality <coughs> review? All this discussion about tests and standards. And the court majority resisted that, went down low and said, what's at stake and how is it justified? Began to evolve, if you will, an idiosyncratic version of rationality review that said, Prove it to us. Uh, we, we're not going to take it on faith, but explain to us what justifications uh, exist for this particular insult, or this particular burden, or this particular line that you're drawing. And, uh, and not generalize. Let's get down uh, uh, more specifically. The, uh, the, the example of that is, that is now, in my view, the crowning uh, full flourished example of that is, is noted in the, in the manuscript, and it's not a Supreme Court decision. It's a decision that Ju Judge Posner handed down just a couple of weeks ago for his circuit court, which again struck down a ban on same-sex marriage in both Wisconsin and Indiana. And uh, you'll see there that it's a, it's a real um, point by point by point inquiry into why a particular claim of justification for a ban against same-sex marriage should suffice. Now, there's no moral claim made in those cases. There's no simple claim that in the name of morality we should be able to bar that kind of marriage because the states didn't advance it. And uh, Posner uh, added that that was probably a wise decision given the fact that Lawrence versus Texas seems to stand for the proposition that a 
a, a simple claim of morality will not be sufficient to justify discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Then they move to all the remaining arguments that are typically heard with respect to a ban against same-sex marriage, that it will preserve uh, the desirability of marriage for heterosexuals, it will uh, protect children, um, it is in the best interest of child welfare, and point by point um, moves through those justifications and finds them wanting, finds them riddled with exceptions, finds them insufficiently uh, based in fact. Now, uh, whether that is going to sustain itself in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, we'll find out in the, in the fullness of time, and I don't think it's going to be very long before it gets to the court. But uh, what I simply want to call to your attention now is that a process of careful and precise inquiry over 15 years has brought us now uh, to a point where the Supreme Court will feel at full liberty to take the case. And in fact, everybody's asking the Supreme Court to take the case now. Um, I'm not predicting uh, unanimity when that happens. Um, uh, I will go on record here as saying uh, that five justices, I think, at least, will uh, come down uh, in favor of striking down these bans. I, I find it um, very difficult to see in anything Justice Kennedy has written, and he has written each of these major opinions. I find nothing in them that he has said that uh, suggests that at this point he is going to move in a different direction. Um, but what, uh, what, what this has to say for the, for, for the Constitution more broadly is um, a question I'll leave you with. Um, do we have a living Constitution? Uh, that, I'm not asking you whether we should have one. Uh, Justice Scalia has lectured in this room about this very challenge uh, years ago. But what I will say you, uh, is as a descriptive matter, uh, we are seeing um, increasing movement uh, in, the, in the name of establishing new constitutional protections in a new era um, against precedent and understandings that just a few generations ago would have easily taken you in a different direction. And uh, that might merit the description of a living constitution. Now, um, thank you. <laughs> we have some time. We have some time and we'd love, we'd love some questions and, and thoughts from you. Uh, my question is for Professor Bryant. Uh, on what report was the Boehner uh, suit filed in place? The real question is, given the length of time that the appellate process and everything, is there anything a court can really do? Are we back in the uh, Jackson era, Andrew Jackson era, but of an imperial presidency? That, I mean, what could a court do? And by the time it yeah, I I, I, um, uh, I I think that you're that you're right that the um, uh, uh, suit is likely unlikely to be um, efficacious uh, in terms of its pur purported legal uh, design, um, which I think it is is you know hard to deny. It's um, uh, and this is not again not necessarily to to disparage, but just an observation that it is a a as much a political gesture um, as an effort for sort of legal remedy. But I do, th my point was just more that it seems to kind of follow logically from uh, the court's involvement in these other areas, um, that this is a place you go um, for uh, a remedy of these kinds of disputes. Even if you aren't gonna get an actual remedy uh, in this case, it seems, it seems to be a, a, a place, a venue for um, uh, airing these kinds of uh, disagreements. No, I'm saying I'm saying I don't think so. Is it, uh, is so. Only, only real limitation on the imperial presidency. Um, it's one. Uh, it's definitely one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, that there are, um, actually, I, th I think that the other branches have lots of uh, tools to bring to bear on um, uh, an executive branch. Impeachment's kind of the ad atom bomb um, of, of this, but um, uh, it, it exists. There's no question about it. Um, the um, uh, the uh, Congress has um, uh, lots of other um, weapons in its arsenal to restrict uh, the executive and uh, provided you can get a uniform Congress to do so. so. Civil 
union with all the rights and privileges without distorting marriage. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the United States Supreme Court or any court thinks that they've done the American people a service by doing that. Well, thanks for your comment. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I, just, just to answer what the, what the courts regularly say in response to that when they are coming out differently from what you would prefer, is that uh, uh, in civil society, legally, to distinguish between those two cases and give one a different appellation than the other, and typically different rights as well, although perhaps you would, you would say they should be the same set of rights, is nonetheless to frown upon one group uh, on the other without sufficient basis. That's the argument. I would want to say one other thing about constitutional change here that I think has been really important. This discourse over the last 10 or 15 years has led a large, a large number of people to think twice about, about the difference between religion, relig a religious marriage, a marriage recognized by a particular church, and the marriage that your government recognizes. And as more, I'm seeing nods here, and as more folks recognize that they, they needn't be one and the same, uh, you have seen space open up for, for same-sex marriage to be recognized uh, legally, but by no means uh, necessitated as something that each, each uh, faith uh, must, uh, must uh, recognize in its own ways. Um, but uh, that there, uh, there you have the controversy in, in America, and uh, thank you for the comment because I think it sharpens the conversation. Yes. Does anyone, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, but would you like to run up? Well, uh, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about that particular issue is that in, in many ways they kind of seem in sync. I don't know which is driving it, but uh, kind of like uh, Luz, the dean said, I think that you are certainly finding that groundswell and change that you commented on. And you're seeing a similar, maybe parallel, um, behavior in the courts, particularly considering that the judges writing all but one of the decisions are appointees of both Republicans and Democrats. You can't say that they're, you know, ideologues on one side or the other. So, uh. there's been so much in, uh, culturally that has changed in the last 25 years, and I, I think that's been a driver. You know, sometimes it's what the courts don't do. Um, that, that uh, and I think that's what I would point out here. I think that the Supreme Court has, has um, had a relatively light but constructive touch in this area over the last 18 years. Um, it, it struck down Bowers versus Hardwick, but it took about eight years of, it took some time to get there once you could see that they might be open to doing that, but they cleared out space for social uh, for, for, for a social debate and for social movement to take place. And then it's, you know, it's been a fairly, it's been another decade to 15 years to where we're now getting to this, to this point. Um, Roe versus Wade has been criticized for moving too rapidly um, at a time when, it's, hindsight's 2020, we'll never, and in this case, maybe not clear enough, whether, whether um, if the court had not decided Roe that there would have been legislative change um, of, of significance to the same point. But um, most, of, most folks who write in the area, I think, seem to think that uh, if the court can follow the social change, um, the change is more likely to be endurable legally than if it's trying to lead it. 
Yes. Well, I think you might, you might just to put a slight tweak on that, I mean, I think there's a question about the um, application of, uh, and I don't think, I don't think um, we would necessarily disagree with this, the application of um, underlying values to new understandings of uh, social facts. Um, uh, right. I mean, I think that um, uh, the dean pointed out the um, uh, observation that when um, uh, the court decided the per curiam decision in 1972, um, uh, gays and lesbians were largely, um, not entirely, but to a great extent to many people, including people sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court, were invisible. Um, and, you know, that changed understanding of facts um, then may uh, require a different result even when you have application of an underlying principle that has been there all along or been immutable. Um, so I think that that's, that's certainly a way that might be what you're saying, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, is that what you're saying? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Go ahead, we'll take another question. Um, well, two things. The first thing, I want to just make a brief comment uh, to the uh, Webster Dictionary comment. Webster Dictionary in and of itself is an evolving document that uh, evolves all the time. For instance, last year's editions of Big Data, Catfish, crowdfunding, fracking, freaking gamification, hashtag faux poutine, selfie, social networking were all added to Webster Dictionary in response to a modern environment mm -hmm. and what we ourselves value as words and terms. And Webster Dictionary does change all the time. The next question I had was to get off of the numerics topic a little bit. Um, Professor Schneider, you spoke to the court kind of identifying right now um, with the national identity of the United I'm wondering if you could briefly comment as to whether or not you think the court is currently pulling from the modern identity, um, United States, uh, or if they're pulling from kind of the ideas of the founders of which we were here today to celebrate the Constitution that was signed in the 1800s. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think that what you're seeing is some of the same debate about you know, who's driving it and who's responding to it. I think one of the difficult things that you see in all three of these cases is um, how much what the court says does shape our identity, um, particularly the tension between democracy, which we consider obviously our most important political concept, and the idea of the Bill of Rights protecting minorities who don't have the power of the ballot box. Um, and yet both, uh, both of those things are protected by the Constitution. So I don't really have an answer for you. I think that's one of the fascinating things about these cases is, uh, you know, how do they answer who are we? And, um, and you see them in different ways, whether it's reflected in the religious identity or whether it's reflected in how we look at um, the role of women in our society and the importance of uh, contraception to their participation fully in the, in the economy and the political structure and so on and so forth. And there you have a clash of two very important uh, values, both in terms of the national identity and in terms of the Constitution. So I think it's an ongoing question. Um, I think it's a credit to the Constitution that we we are able to have this kind of conversation that is taking us in lots of different directions. Um, what I'd like to do is ask you to take the direction upstairs to the atrium with us, uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of law that gets taught in this building, and some of it happens in this room at 1.30. So thank you very much. <laughs>